morning and welcome to Loose on the Lead. Oh, you're yeah, almost, we're you're almost dropped oh, the ball. No, no, I, 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 You've been locked in all week? <laughs> when I left really? the house, it was kind of on the drive up. Loose on the Lead, Loose on the Lead, Loose on the Lead. <laughs> I, it was kind of a... Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, we're back. Saratoga season. We've been looking forward to it. Steve Beck from Sirius and XM's at the races. Back at the table as we are here for our first Sunday live from Saratoga. Seth Merrill from Equidalia as well. Loose on the Lead, welcome back. Thank you. Nice to be back, uh, as threatened, as uh, <laughs> or as promised, depending on your view. And uh, at the top of the show, I pulled up, uh, if the guys can pull it up, I pulled up a couple of pictures from your Twitter feed just so we can let people know what Mr. Bick has been up to. Bick and, Bick and Spouse uh, early in the season. Derby Barbie. Picking some blueberries and How about out of Finger Lakes. How about that? Out of Finger Lakes. It's Talk a little bit about the summer so far. Look at that. And I, know, <laughs> I think she's watching, I'm pretty sure. Uh, for those of you that are fairly new to the area, I, I, I thought this would be fun to let people know. You, you got Winnie's Farm right out there in Bacon Hill, uh, you know, just up uh, the road from Schuylerville, 32. And uh, pick your own blueberries until September, uh, buckets of them. It's a lot of fun. And uh, then you go home and you do whatever you want. I uh, got muffins. Uh, I made those muffins. Uh, Going to make a blueberry buckle uh, later. You What's heard? A, a blueberry buckle? Buckle is that like a it's like tart a crisp? Or no, it's like a cri crisp. It's, okay. it's like a crisp. Or, uh, but we had a really nice time. And and there, look at that. That is picturesque. It is. Farmingdale, New York, Finger Lakes uh, was uh, over there on Tuesday and had uh, some business in Rochester. So uh, we went and saw our son uh, Zach, at, at, uh, who lives and works in Rochester. And then I said, "There's no way we're not stopping at Finger Lakes." Got a, a quick uh, tour, and uh, I had never been. I had never been, and I've it's never a been. really pleasant, uh, literally the proverbial clean, well-lighted place. And for those that disparage little tracks, it, it's so unfair because chances are the people that take those shots have never actually been to those facilities. It's a really nice little place and of course Saturday the New York Derby looking forward to that field coming together which will then feed into the Albany here the Big Apple triple uh, really nice not only did we make it to Finger Lakes lunch in Geneva on the lake nice then Sylvan Beach where I hadn't been in 35 years and it hasn't changed a whole hell of a lot uh, really a lot of fun nice so uh, yeah you've been uh, making the most of your summer. I've been up in Maine four times. I was going to get four in touch. Times. I was going to get in touch with you and the wife and tell you when there, there was, has been no open slots. It uh, because I was up there. The whole, I, part of the time I was up there, there was the, the entire family. The Fourth of July, nephews and their kids and everything. So I've been kicking back on the beach uh, up in Maine. But now we are six days away. The countdown and five days away from going to Maine. No. <laughs> Well, I thought about it today, and I thought, yeah, I can't. I thought, well, maybe one more, squeeze in one more, but I couldn't. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, opening day on Friday. should be a lot of fun. We're here live on the racetrack. It's funny, though, uh, Finger Lakes, as you were talking about Finger Lakes, I wanted to mention, had Mike McAdam sitting in here uh, on Thursday from the Daily Gazette, and I pulled up from his Twitter feed. He was on vacation earlier. He made a Finger, Finger Lakes Lake, visit. Sure. He had a point of view uh, uh, shot on his Twitter feed. It was nice. He's sitting at a table in front of him, the, the uh, uh, Finger Lakes Forum, and a bottle of beer. There you go. They Summertime. Had, they had a nice crowd there uh, for a Tuesday. It was a hot day. That I'll tell you. But uh, you I, say I, hello I to our friend uh, Tony Kale. Uh, we went upstairs uh, for I think the third race. We were up in the judges' stand, and uh, Judge Coker, Bill Coker, who's a, a big circuit judge up there, he brought us around, and he'll be at Saratoga on a regular basis. Uh, a well-known figure. And uh, then we had to keep pressing, you know, had to, had to actually get back because we had the show on Wednesday. I, I did something different this year. Instead of taking a week off, I ended up taking Monday, Tuesday off three weeks in a row. Oh, that's, a and I, that's essentially what I was doing. Well, there was too many good, there was just too much good summer racing. I mean, the, between it the It really July has been amazing. I've said it every week uh, doing the show here. You think the Triple Crown ends and you're in a lull. No. Uh, no. It, every weekend there was something going on. And, and let's uh, let's get into talking about uh, this weekend. In fact, before we talk stakes racing, though, I pulled up a race the other night from Presque Isle Downs. And I did that because I had Dick Powell sitting in here uh, talking Presque Isle with me on uh, Thursday. And we talked a little bit about this opener, which was a, a, a Maiden Special Weight event. 
And then Dick stopped by again on Friday, and he said he was on with you as well yeah. on uh, Thursday. And you guys were talking about this opener at Presque Isle Downs, uh, maiden special weight event. And, of course, uh, the eventual winner, number two, Awesome Dream, Harry Peace trains. And the daily racing form statistics right. aren't really showing anything as far as first-time starters. But Dick said Steve had sussed out a nice little statistic on his own, a first-time starter, 13 to 1, first time out of the box. This is, and the reason, the, I'm glad you brought this out. And, you know, for those of you that watched Seth uh, with, with Dick or heard him with me, we're talking about the, the two-horse who gets passed, and she had been uh, on top, a first-time starter by big drama, and look at this. She re-rallies and, and gets up and wins. The reason this is an interesting outcome, and, and I, I bring it up because we're getting ready for probably the most intense handicapping period of the year for a lot of players that look forward to Saratoga and maybe Del Mar all year long. And, you know, this is Presque Isle, so it's, it's far flung. However, the information that was involved here is very germane. As Seth mentioned, Dick's talking about this first race, and I'm looking at the, I looked at it for three seconds, and I see this first time starter, and big drama can get a fast horse. Harry Peace is an obscurity, 0 for 17 on the year. I then pull up Thurograph, the full Thurograph sheets for the two-year-olds, and the first thing that you notice is that the horse has a fast sibling a sibling that won first out and got a single digit figure. And I also noticed right away under the trainer stats on Thurograph that Harry Peace, he's not 0 for 2 with first time starters. He's actually 3 for 8 over the last five years with five horses in the money. Horse is going to be 8, 9, 12, 10 to 1. Why not? You know it's a fast family. And you got a guy that's Nature got and some, nurture. Yeah, a little bit. In fact, uh, in fact uh, I almost said to Dick, you're stealing that line from, from <laughs> Seth Merrow. But my point here is you got to do the work. We're going to have Mike Vesey later this morning from Daily Racing Forum, the clocker, and we'll talk about clockings and we'll talk about reports and notations and how to utilize those in your handicapping. But the message is that there's things below the surface that will reward you for the work. And this, this was a, a, a really kind of a bonanza, pays 29.20, and it cleans up a lot of, you know, messes in aisle five uh, for <laughs> the places that you miscued or misbet. And I, the one message out of this, do the work, go the extra mile, buy the extra piece of information that maybe gives you an edge that the public that's operating strictly off of a certain set of PPs that they don't have. And you hear this from Andy, you know, from Andy Sterling, watch the videos if it's replays, do the pedigree work on, on fast uh, siblings or on dams uh, that uh, had aptitude, uh, whether it's wet, turf, short, long, do the work and you'll get paid. Yeah, and that's when you do get paid, when you're bringing something to the table that the other people don't have. Absolutely. All right, let's take a look at some of that stakes action from yesterday. And first up, I wanted to take a look at the undercard stake, actually, at uh, New York, because I think this will be a nice little uh, New York-bred uh, two-year-old coming out of the Gary Contessa barn. Second-time starter, Runaway Loot, was in the Rockville Center yesterday, $125,000 up for grabs. They went six furlongs. Runaway Loot had a troubled start and then had to kind of rush yeah. up, but coming down the stretch did not have any trouble at all. Runaway root, Loot in here will be the number four horse. Went off as the second choice. The favorite was Silver Mission. That one will run third. Ethan Hunt, the number two horse for Todd Fletcher, runs second. In fact, both the second and third horses were Fletcher horses. But again, Runaway Loot, a, uh, obviously, as the name indicates, a son of uh, Midnight Loot, New York bred. I think Gary Contessa has a nice little New York bred two-year-old. Well, it must be a good uh, year to be named Gary and have two-year-olds because, of course, uh, Tribeca last w Sunday for Gary Siaka. Who had a and, really nice spring uh, summer. Uh, just absolutely busted out, and he's a bust in stones. So the two-year-old boys so far are really impressing, and whether it's this one or Tribeca, uh, there's uh, some things to like. And frankly, they're running uh, 68 buyer for Tribeca, 72 buyer for Runaway Loot, Yesterday, 
they're running as fast as the open company two-year-old so far. So uh, very, uh, very heady. And, you know, those New York brands, they start with an advantage. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that's the truth, actually. They do. They do uh, uh, and speaking of which, let's get a, a little uh, catch up on, on where DT Stable is right Well, we've got actually the New York Red Philly, the, the unraced three-year-old, uh, Salvador Dali, uh, and she's ready to ship. She'll, she'll be up here, I think, within the next 10 days, and uh, she's had an extended, you know, she had the winter off, uh, had had a little knee thing, and that's cleared up, and uh, she's ready to go. And right behind her, there's a, uh, here comes Ben uh, out of Enter. Uh, sibling to uh, Piazza de Spagna, and uh, she's not far off. So we got a couple more. Williams Lucky Gray is just about to come back from 90 days turned out. She uh, she had a busy winter and she ran well, uh, got a win in February. Uh, but in her last start at Aqueduct, she kind of wrenched an ankle, and so she uh, got turned out. And she actually was well due uh, some time off, so she'll be back. But I think you know she's a Maryland bred. I think I'm actually going to uh, maybe give her to uh, Ferris Allen down in Maryland. <laughs> Uh, and let her run for that 30% bonus uh, in Maryland. And uh, so that uh, will They're probably going all summer down happen. there now, so. Yeah, exactly. All, all right, right. Thanks let's, for let's move on uh, uh, again uh, down in the Mid-Atlantic region. Yesterday, one of the highlights of the Delaware Park calendar, the Delaware Handicap. And, and uh, hopefully the guys got the uh, shot of the start because that's kind of the story here. But whichever order they have it in, stretch, and, then, uh, and I'm being told we're, we'll watch the stretch run first. Number four, I'm a chatterbox as the three to five favorite gets it done. Number one, uh, paid up subscriber, the ch second choice runs second. Number six, pen with third. No surprise here that I'm a chatterbox gets it done, but that she stays up after a look by the stewards uh, is kind of questionable because we will get a shot here of the start as well. And when you look at that, look at her coming out of the four hole and look at the number one horse, paid up subscriber, who winds up running second because that was where the foul was claimed by paid up subscriber. But you'll see I'm a chatterbox come in and really kind of take the whole field out inside of her. And uh, number one, uh, I'm a paid-up subscriber, kind of loses the back end a little bit here. I said on the handicapper support earlier, Steve, this happens at the eighth pole. It's 100% well, DQ, but they, they, uh, there's a lot of leeway now in the first eighth of a mile. And here's a perfect head-on, and you'll see exactly what happens as Malaya, as well as Money's on Charlotte, get completely compromised. And, okay, yes, paid-up subscriber gets back uh, within a jump or two. It, it's not so much that they left I'm a chatterbox up that was uh, so egregious. Very often, as we know, get a lot of leeway. The horse into those uh, other other runners, but you can see right. So the other horses should have. It's the, the most idiotic <laughs> interpretation. Uh, and, of course, I don't have the Delaware rules about the start, but the rules are generally the same coming out of the gate. But uh, you see that? You see the, uh, the right arm, the way Giroux is, is, is pulling the reins? He's trying to straighten her as quickly as possible. So I get leaving her up, but you know what? Just say that. Just say that the contact early uh, wasn't enough to impact the, uh, the running order in, at the end and leave it at that. Even if you're wrong about it, it wasn't as bad as their preposterous explanation. Yeah, I, for me, I'd take, oh, that was bad, I thought. I, if I was a steward, I would have taken down. But the, the explanation, yeah, you could say that for what, like 80% of the, <laughs> the DQs.
Now get all the racing information you need right on your mobile device with Capital OTB's new mobile app. Wager anytime, anywhere, right from your smartphone or tablet. Watch, wager, and win right at your fingertips. The new Capital OTB mobile app. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook and get in the game. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, fantastic food and drinks, an amazing Vegas-style atmosphere with seating for nearly 900 of your closest friends. Conveniently located at 711 Central Avenue, right off exit 5 of I-90 in Albany, the Clubhouse Racebook is the better choice. Can you hear it? The sound of excitement. Something we infuse into every grape that goes into our exceptional full-bodied wine. That was closer than I thought it would be. Now, if you'll excuse me. Fourteen hands, where great times are made. In a recent study of some of the top online wagering sites, Capital OTB won big in total player rewards, far surpassing some of the best-known wagering sites in America. While other rewards programs simply offer you points redeemable for gift cards, Capital OTB's rebates are paid to you in actual cash. Plus, Capital OTB gives you full and immediate access to your money. So if all you're getting now are points and gift cards, join Capital OTB Player Rewards today and get cash back. Visit CapitalOTBBet.com and sign up today. Conquistadors, Yellow puts ahead in front. Alamo's ruler on the outside is second. And Runaway Groom from Canada moves up. Runaway Groom alongside the inner two. Those three to the wire. Runaway Groom, Alamo's ruler. Conquistadors, Yellow, Runaway Groom in front. Welcome back to Loose on the Lead on this Sunday morning, live from Saratoga. We're only four days up here, so a little glitch uh, came along there. We lost the signal momentarily, but we are back. Seth Merrill, Steve Vick, Loose on the Lead, and we are joined now by our friend Dave Litvin. Dave Litvin, uh, now you can find him at the Blood Horse, I believe. Dave, good morning. Give us a little update on where people can find you. Morning. Uh, well, after... Uh 27 years as a public handicapper, Daily News, Metro Turf, the Racing Forum. Branched out now, I'm freelance, I'm in the Blood Horse, uh, a column known as Litvin at Large on Saturdays. And also for Twin Spires up here for the big uh, weekend stakes, we'll be doing some handicapping for them. Uh, a little work for the press office, shows with you once or twice a week. I'm all over the place this summer. There you go. So uh, Dave Litvin, who, what, what was it, two, three years ago, you were the king of the public handicappers? 2012, 2007. In 2014, I thought I had one of my best years, but uh, the guy uh, Shapazian from the Saratoga Special was just out of his mind that summer. So, second best that that year. But and did, is that the one? <laughs> is that the one that came down to like the last two or three races? Maybe even the last race. And no, you went up and made the big bet just to like. That was bet. actually in 2012 where it did come down to the last race, and I bet. Uh, and the other guy's horse just yeah. like, well, if he's going to beat me, I'm going to come up with something. Yeah, for it, it. might, might have been Kyle Bruno. I'm not sure who it was. But. <laughs> Very good. Very so, happy to lose that. Bet. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so folks will still be able to find your uh, selections during the, the race meet. Yes. Excellent. So we'll be looking forward to that. We're going to have a little uh, pre-Saratoga conversation here and get some ideas, talk a little bit about the various divisions. Before we do that, though, as people come into Saratoga, do you have any, like, overarching philosophies when you come to Saratoga? Speed, babies, trainers you watch, or when you're coming in, are there, uh, you know, you have some bullet points that you're looking for in particular? Well, it's like Mike Tyson used to say, everybody comes in with a plan until they get punched in the face. 
you know, and Saratoga can be like that. I mean, y y it's it's very hard to really grasp what's going to happen because it, it's never the same. You know, we started off last year, you know, and one of the first things you learn as a better is don't bet Bill Mutt's first-time starters. You know, you just don't do that. So on day two, he has a horse win by five lengths at uh, 24 to 1, and then the next day he has another one win at 11 to 1. You know, so then, then all bets are off. Then you start looking for Bill Mott's first years, doesn't win one the rest of the meet. You know, obviously it, it's Todd Pletcher with the two-year-olds, and you're kind of playing off of that. But, you know, um, the public winds up doing a very good job with these races despite limited information. Um, you might want to consider availing yourselves of the, the workout services. There's a couple of pretty good ones. Um, with the two-year-olds being such a part of the program here, if you're playing multi-race exotics, you're going to have to deal with them. Uh, many times on the blind, so it can be helpful to, you know, have some kind of an inkling there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's hit it. Some of the divisions, obviously, uh, three-year-old fillies are going to be exciting this year. The three-year-old boys will hope the three separate winners of the Triple Crown races come up. I just wanted to touch on also the handicap division. I've said it the last couple of weeks. Um, California Chrome, obviously, we're going to be excited to see how he comes back next week out in Southern California. And I'm excited to see what Frosted does off of this Met Mile. And we're going to go back and take a look at, at that number uh, five, Will Be Frosted. He was a two-to-one favorite that day. He wins like he should have been about one-to-five. Phenomenal performance. And they're clearly at the top of the division. FNX last week, his performance, I think he's playing, I think, uh, Pacific Classic out in Southern California. Woodward is with me here in Saratoga. I think we're going to start to define this division a little bit. But what, do you, what are your thoughts on Frosted, FNX, and what we're going to see at the handicap division up here? Well, listen, F FNX, any horse that can win the Suburban twice in a row, you know, it's a pretty good company. Um, Frosted, I've never exactly had a great handle on him. Last year when he won the Pennsylvania Derby, I, to me he looked like the next will take charge. And I, I, you know, I really was all over him for the classic, figuring he's going to run a bang up race, at least be second. Um, and just totally flat. Then he comes back, you know, in, a, in the prep for the World Cup. And again, looks like a world beater. I'm like, this, this is probably the horse to beat here. And, you know, I think he can give California Chrome a run for his money. Totally flat. Didn't know what to make of him that mile day. Uh, but, you know, he just turned in a, a, an effort here of historical proportions. And, you know, now it's going to be, can he reproduce that up here at Saratoga? I mean, last year, you know, he ran a terrific race in the Travers. It was kind of on a suicide mission, you know, to get American Pharaoh uh, beat. He still held on pretty well for third. Um, but, you know, I don't think you're going to get another 123 buyer out of him. But if he bounces 15 points, I think that'll still be pretty good. Yeah, I'm excited to see him, as I say, in the comeback. Steve? You know, the thing with the Frosted that he's going to have to prove is if the two turn, mm -hmm. he's just he's just okay. Mm -hmm. And when you set him up for the one turn opportunity, that's really what he's been best at. I mean, you think back to the Champagne and you think back to some of those performances as a young horse. And there were plenty of people that kept saying, turn him back, turn him back, right. cut him back. And you know, we see uh, things like the King's Bishop uh, when you get mm -hmm. the, the three-year-olds. Uh, look at what uh, Tom's Reddy did in the Woody Stevens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the kind of uh, you know that's the kind of question mark that I think Frosted still is going to have to answer here. And uh, is he just okay to turning? Uh, and is he really ultimately Absolutely. best served one turning? So we'll go from there. I mean, if if, if it turns out that indeed. He's just ordinary at uh, two turns. Then they can refocus toward the cigar mile and uh, and go after that kind of a of an avenue. Yep, this race determines you know classic or dirt mile or you know which eight or eight furlongs or ten furlongs. I think nine on his best day he probably gets it. Still not sold at ten. Now and the configuration always you know this is always a, an equation. Look at what happened uh, last night with Cupid. Baffert said, "Okay, I've learned my lesson. He's a two-turn horse." And he needs the slower opening fractions mm -hmm. to, so that he can be involved. And sure enough, he puts him right in the, into the race. And uh, Bayerano rode him perfectly, and he guts out a, a, another Grade Two win. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's a horse that people had written off as as DOA after the Easy Goer. No, so very difficult horse to It's just you know this is a big <coughs> part of of not just uh, handicapping equations, but decisions for outfits and. and you know, everybody wants the glory division, the, the three-year-old classics or uh, handicap uh, classics, but th there's nothing wrong with those with mm -hmm. those one-turn opportunities. Yeah. And let's uh, talk about one of the other divisions. We want to go back and watch Flintshire 
from last year in the Sword Dancer. Perhaps one of the most impressive performances, if not the most impressive performance at the meet. Flintshire here will be the number two horse, winning as the even money favorite. Now goes out for Chad Brown this year in his bar. Uh, won the, the last start uh, in the first start for Chad uh, down in New York. Uh, it looks like they're looking to race back up here at Saratoga as opposed to going out to Chicago for the Arlington Million. I, I'm looking forward to him to see if we can get another performance like this. And off of what he did the first time out for Chad, I think it's probably likely. Yeah, last year they doubled the purse to a million dollars in the hopes of attracting some international competition and it really worked like a charm, you know, to get this horse to come over and adapt the way he has to, to U.S. racing. Uh, and the way he came back in the Manhattan, you'd have to say he's as, as good as ever. Um, one thing to keep in mind on the, the grass down there, that it's just been supersonic times one after the other. They've been cutting the, the courses shorter than in years past, and now the irrigation system is computerized, so not necessarily watering every spot, you know, depending on what it really needs. Plus, with the dry spring, you, you're going to see a lot of horses coming in with these times, and you're just going to be, wow, you know, seven furlongs and 120 flat. That's great. Um, it remains to be seen. I, I have a feeling we'll probably do the same thing up here and clip them short. So it could be horses that like to hear their feet rattle, like Flintshire, are going to do well up here. Yeah, and, and again, he'll, he'll be one we'll be watching in a summer that I think is going to play out in the various divisions. And probably the one, as I said earlier, that the three separate winners of the Triple Crown races, we'll keep our fingers crossed, they come in the Travers. But I think that three-year-old Philly division is really interesting this year. Songbird's going to come east and take on... Uh, East Coast three-year-old fillies after really dominating out at the west in the West Coast uh, this year. We'll have Mike Messi on a little bit later. Karina and me had a nice workout up here recently, and it looks like they'll face off. What are your thoughts about Songbird coming east? You know, this is easily going to be her stiffest test to date, I think. I mean, you look back at the horses behind her in the, in the juvenile fillies last fall, it really hasn't turned into much, you know, it's more a negative key race than anything, I think. And, you know, she just, you know, she had a couple races, you know, she hasn't really had somebody, you know, at her throat latch. And Karina Mina is a very good horse, and she's doing at the top of her game. You know, she's battle-tested this year in grade one races. And Songbird, she's, I, you know, she hasn't faced a filly of this caliber yet, I don't think. It's just hard to, to evaluate her because she, she just makes everybody look so bad. <laughs> but, you know, we'll see. I mean, if American Pharaoh could come in here and get beat, anybody can get beat, so... Yeah, I, I think this is kind of the, the test coming east. I was hoping Catherine Sophia would be in there. I like her a lot. It looks like she's going to go that new race down at Parks. Well, no, that's a, that's a, but that's not that's not until the end of August. She's she's pointed so, for the so, test. Okay. And then he's mm. going to stretch her out into right. that okay. Princess of Silmar. But uh, John Service has every intention to bring it. From the first Sophia. article I read, yeah. I wasn't sure whether they were going to go straight to that Parks no, race no. or not. Okay, well, that makes sense. But uh, it, regardless, then, she's, she's going to cut back, and so we won't see her in either the coaching club or the Alabama up here, which is, uh, again, I like her, so I'm kind of unfortunate, but you can see why they're, they're going to do that. Talk, Dave, talk a little bit about two-year-olds are so important up here. Um, and, again, you were at the top of the public handicappers list for a couple of seasons recently. Talk a little bit about how you approach two-year-old races, particularly first-time starters. Uh, you know, it's workouts, sales information, trainers, obviously. Um, and, you know, the tote board can help you sometimes. Uh, it's not, you know, of course, Todd Pletcher is going to open up four to five in a, a majority <laughs> of cases. When a, when a horse from under the radar connection starts taking money, then you have to pay attention. Uh, the Philly, she's already last year an example. New York bred, trained by Jimmy Ryerson. Ten horse field. Pletcher's in the race for the first time. There's a couple others coming out of good efforts. She's already is two to one. And the, the board is just telling you, you know, even without having access to workout reports, which were glowing, you could say, well, something's up with this horse because this is not uh, Mr. and Mrs. John Q. Public over here, you know, at the picnic yeah. tables betting Jim Marius in the first <laughs> time out. And, you know, she was just an early mature, and she just won off by eight lengths and came right back to win a stakes. Um, I pay attention to the, to the first crop sires, especially because their connections want to have them make a splash and come out, you know, especially during sales week right around then. Um, Mission Impassable. Uh, firsters look like they're going to be all right. Uh, the Factors babies have been very well received at the sales. Uh, and, and again, you know, maybe consider subscribing to a couple of the workout reports just to, because it's such a big part of the program up here. I'll toss one other, and I used uh, Tommy Proctor's first time starter by this one yesterday who had trouble at the gate. I said, put consulting in your stable mail. Didn't, did not end up looking good in the chart, but I 
Well, McLean's music, I think it might turn out to be uh, interesting going forward. And we're still so early in it, we may get some prices with that yeah, one. Yeah, one race, 114 buyer speed figure. So, you know, no telling. I mean, Danzig was one of the greatest sires of the last 50 years. I think he raced three times. So, you know, the race record doesn't necessarily have to be the most important thing, but he was fast. Yeah, and, and again, it's early, so far early in the career. I had the stat yesterday when I talked about the Tommy Proctor horse. Out of seven first-time starters, two had won before yesterday, mm -hmm. and two others of two of the other five won in their second career start. So I think there's some potential there that that one uh, could be interesting. Uh, Dave, also, you, you alluded to it earlier. Uh, you ran through your, your list of publications you've worked for. Talk a little bit about how you became a fan of the racing game. Uh, well, OTD was just coming into existence in Manhattan, and uh, one opened about three blocks away from me on 72nd Street and Broadway. And uh, as it happened, uh, my best friend uh, in grade school, the Wizard, uh, was going to the track on weekends with his dad. So between tagging along, uh, you know, for the weekends and walking in and just seeing what was going on there and realizing this could have a real impact on my life. It was just a great time, you know, and it was the golden age of racing. It was yeah. Ruffy and Forgo, Affirmed and Alidar, spectacular bit, so it, it was pretty easy to get hooked. Yeah, what, which one did you latch on to, did, or did you have one? For me, it was Forgo. Uh, I was Affirmed, yeah. 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 Not surprised. Were you, so you were down in New York. When did you make your first four-way up to Saratoga? Not till 1985. That was, uh, I started with the Naira Press Office in 84, but in September. Uh, my second day was uh, the day Shifty Sheik almost won the Woodward uh, in the slot. Uh, so I didn't get up here uh, actually till the next summer, 85. So 30-something summers later, here we are. Uh, yeah. The rest is history. Yeah. And, and talk a little bit about Saratoga as compared to other venues as far as handicapping. It will, it will really test every facet of what you think you know as a handicapper. You know, you're going to start off with a five for a long main race for two-year-olds. You're going to go to a mile and three-eighths on the grass, you know, yeah. optional claimers. You're going to have a steeplechase race um, and everything else in between. And, you know, everybody's trying. You know, everybody everybody would trade two or three wins anywhere else for a win here. So, Yeah, and, and for me, uh, if, if I go back 10 or 15 years, I think I used to be stronger handicapping just overall at the meet because I think the racing has changed a little bit. I think the quality has changed. Not that they're bad races to bet into. I think you get big competitive fields, and that's what makes them tough to handicap up here. So, so the, the racing itself uh, has changed a little bit. But I also look, and this has been true right throughout, as you say, there are barns and trainers that point for the meet. And there are also a lot of uh, – this is what makes the, the Breeders' Cup, for instance, so, so difficult to handicap. Horses coming in from different venues, trainers coming in they may not be familiar with, and jockeys that are coming in that you might not be familiar with. And all of those just add unknowns to the puzzle that help make Saratoga so uh, intriguing. Yeah, I mean, you know, the best advice I could probably give someone is map out the whole card, you know, that morning, whatever. Mark down which races you think are just like hopelessly competitive where, you, you know, you're going to need to use eight horses in there. And there's going to be a couple, and you're going to have, you know, you're going to have your standout favorites. Uh, you know, try to leverage those maybe. You know, one of the mistakes I've made is looking for value in every competitive race and, and betting a steady diet of eight and ten to one shots. And before you know it, you, you know, you're on a 20 race losing streak. You know. And there's, there's one element of this, Dave, that should be included that in the last couple of years I, I kind of came into focus for me personally. And that is we've gotten so used to four day and five day weeks. To come back to a six-day racing week with an average of 10 races a day, mm -hmm. with field size going from averaging probably about eight up to about 10 and a half to 11, suddenly you're spending way more time on each race. You're having to look at a lot more horses. It's taking way more time. There's an exhaustion factor. Mm -hmm. There's a elasticity to the bankroll factor that you have to plan your money out a, a little bit more judiciously mm -hmm. because you will run out of racetrack in about the second week of August, and and also you'll get physically tired. I mean, yeah. I, I I think it's it's yeah. a point worth making that if if you go into the meet off of the the typical Wednesday to Sunday work suddenly you're going to feel taxed and yeah. you're going to start making mistakes because you start glossing over horses mm -hmm. and then you get into a hole and then you start 
chasing and you start getting desperate, and the next thing you know, the meat is, yeah. is you're a chicken in a pot. So uh, just uh, mm -hmm. pick your spots and wade into it. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from Steve Fierro in uh, Four Quarters sure. of Horse Investing. Sure. He said, if you don't have a, a way to get to the contenders in a race in five minutes, you better get another way to do it. Because, <laughs> you know, the, the, the big mistake a lot of people make is they spend 90% of their time handicapping the race down to the minutest detail, and then they figure out how they're going to bet it while they're online at the window. And it's just, it just uh, it's not going to work. No. No, and things like you know things like the fifty cents denominations, they you got to make it work for you. Uh, the fifty cent pick five, which uh, if, if there's a spot for small players with limited bankroll and you want to swing for fences, the pick five is the place to do it. Between the advantageous mm -hmm. takeout structure uh, and the fact that fifty cents goes a long way for you in terms of building multiples, there's so many opportunities on every card. Make sure you've got a blueprint going in uh, so you don't get steamrolled. Yeah. And what is your bet? I'm an exacty guy, but I've been playing the pick pick threes and pick fours a little more over the past few years. Pick threes I like because if you can get yourself alive to, uh, the first couple of legs, um, hopefully like with a first-time starter, that's maybe it's four to one, uh, but you, ha you have an inkling that's going to be live, you might get a little of value you know, in the multi-race yeah. pools. And then if I can get to that third leg alive for, you know, like with four of the six contenders, then I can kind of hedge my bets a little. I so I, I like to play the pick three. You know, the pick fours, you know, it, it's, it's tough to be right a lot, but the pick threes you can kind of, you know, and if you, if you have an opinion on one, you can, you know, get three pick threes going, you know, three, four, five, four, five, six, five, six, seven, and you have a linchpin horse there, you know, that can make your day or I'm your week. I'm with you. I just want New York yeah. to go to the 50 cent pick three. Yeah. And that, that, to me, then allows you a little more leeway even. Uh, Dave, uh, we'll wrap things up now, but again, uh, folks can find your uh, selections during the Saratoga meet uh, in the Blood Horse. You'll be doing some work for Naira, and you have a Twitter account, too. Twitter account, Twin Spires, Facebook. Twitter account handle? Uh, at Dave Lippin. So you can look for that yes. as well. And again, we'll have Dave plugged in uh, racing across America on a uh, regular basis also. All right, we'll head to our next break. A little bit later on, Mike Bessie from the Daily Racing Forum. He has been up here checking out some workouts, so we'll get some ideas on some horses he's seen and is high on, and uh, much more conversation. As Loose on the Lead continues, stay tuned. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, and amazing Vegas-style atmosphere, the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue, Albany. Come on. I want sales reports on my desk by Monday. Whoops. My bad. Love racing? RTN brings you every live simulcast on your home television, plus live video streaming and race replays on your PC and mobile devices. To order, visit RTN.TV. RTN, a breed apart. Face it, most horse racing websites are just too much, too much clutter, too much to navigate through. Next time, log on to CapitalOTV.com. Our newly designed website is easier than ever to use with all the information the professional horse player needs. CapitalOTV.com. We're back on Loose on the Lead on this Sunday morning. First show from the backstretch. Great to have uh, Seth Merrill and uh, back together after uh, a little bit of a hiatus. Particularly fun this morning to have Mike Vesey 
from the Daily Racing Forum, the Clocker Report, and of course he and Mike Welsh have been putting vi just incredibly valuable information in the hands of players uh, the last several years, about three years now, right? You've been... This is my fourth year at Saratoga. Year. Yeah, this is my fourth Saratoga Holy here for the Daily Racing Forum. Time flies when you're having fun. Well, <laughs> it's the rest of the year. Belmont in, in Palm Meadows. Yeah, up and down the coast, but uh, despite the, a little bit of that uh, New England accent, He's, uh, he's hit uh, all kinds of uh, highlights around uh, the country, including going to University of Louisville for yes. the uh, equine program, right? Yes, sir. And uh, we're not going to dive into anything before you confirm one of the great betting stories near misses in recent racing history. Which, which one was that? We're talking about the Churchill Breeders' Cup. Your Uncle Bill Perry, oh, okay. <laughs> Northeast Bound, if Northeast Bound wins that photo with War Chant in the mile, you guys take down the entire pool for the pick three. Would have made more money on the pick three than he would have won the 600000 I was I was 18 at the time, and uh, I was at Suffolk Downs actually that day. I couldn't make it out to Churchill, but I was rooting for that horse. And, and Northeast Bound, what a, what a name for some Northeast guys. But uh, that's, that's really got the bug in me, was following my uncle. And he had some really top-notch horses uh, as I grew up. And uh, I got bit by the bug, and that was it, Steve. Well, and uh, a good guy to learn from. Bill Perry, as Learned accomplished a, a horseman as, uh, as anybody. Physical illness that uh, kind of interrupted and, and you know took him away from the racetrack. I learned a lot from him. And it's uh, anywhere I've gone in this game, if I mention his name, oh. it's crazy. Uh, the, the admiration as not only as a horseman but as a person absolutely and uh that makes me feel good as a as a nephew so uh, uh i guess i I've, i'm in pretty good company well does anybody remember what the other two horses were what made it uh, a crazy pick three well you had spain and you had oh, spain, uh, caressing. Okay. Right, spain yeah, and caressing win the first two legs and oh. uh well and and uh. we, we were my, we had the barbecue business at, at churchill and barbecue bill bill mayberry was really close with your uncle and so we were betting northeast bound, <laughs> and uh, we, had, we had found Spain somehow. Bill had found Spain. I had found caressing. You know, it was by Thunder Gulch. I'm standing in line with Bill. I said, Bill, look at this. I said, Thunder Gulch finished 35 to 1. But that's us. <laughs> so we, and we hooked everything up. Everything was through northeast bound later. Unbelievable. I think I had $10 across the board on, on <laughs> that day, and I was like the richest kid in, in Revere that day. It was, it was, <laughs> Uh, and he, and he just it. got beat. That was what a race that was. Going to talk about Mike's tremendous work and his tremendous eye, and how you can interpret what kind of information is delivered to you in the Crocker Report. It's basically about ten dollars a day, and I talked at the beginning of the show about paying a little extra to get a, a, a kernel of information. And in our conversation with uh, Dave Lippin just now, we talked about some of the, the babies uh, at Saratoga. Last year, if you were following the Clocker Report, Mike Vesey helped you find outsider art for our friends uh, Dell and Martha Pettigrew and Jonathan Shepard, $52. That one sticks in my mind. Play Unified was another one that paid 40 something dollars. In terms of identifying horses, Mike, that have a kernel of a chance at, at potentially big prices, what do you see and how do you communicate what feels like an obscurity to the general public? Right, well, like, uh, and I heard uh, Dave talk earlier, you're gonna have the Pletchers at one to five and that's, that's natural. But what you wanna see is you still have to handicap. I may have a horse that's working, as you know, a B plus, which is an excellent grade, but draws the rail for a trainer that doesn't win maybe all first time out all the time. In the same race, you may have a horse that's working good solid Bs, and I have maybe some positive comments. I might write and run uh, write that he or she uh, is really improved, or I might throw in a little comment to kind of tip the hand that way. That horse draws the five post by a sire who's known to win first out with a trainer that wins maybe ten to fifteen. I'm going to play my money on that horse, especially if it's eight to one over the horse that, you know, I don't care how good you are, you have to be very special to win debuting from the rail. So workouts to me are very important. It's the edge that I use, but I still have to handicap the races. All those tools and elements of handicapping, you still have to uh, 
uh, uh, use when, when picking your horses. Uh, agreed, and when it comes to some of the things that you write, and you know, on, on Twitter, I, I, every time I cash a ticket, based on information that, that you or, or Welsh provided, I, I want the public to know, because you know, I'm not finding these on my own. I, I mean, certainly, yes, there's other pieces of information. Uh, I talked about that horse at Presque Isle uh, from Thursday. Uh, yeah, there was a fast sibling, so knowing that helped, and finding out about the trainer, just as Mike is saying. But you've also got a couple of little, little terms. Whenever you mention that a horse worked with ears pricked, it is invariably a, a horse that runs well. The other one you talk about, and I can even uh, suggest last Sunday when Tribeca scored at 40 to 1 for Siaka and Henning, uh, that was a, a horse that you had talked about how easily he had worked with the rider motionless. When you make note of a rider that, that wasn't asking, uh, when you say without ask or rider motionless, uh, I also see all the time when you make special mention of the gallop out and the double gallops and finishing with great energy, uh, basically finishing the work with the right way. Those are that little extra above the B or the B plus that you know, the public says, well, I, I, he didn't really say, he just gave him a B or a B plus. You can tell when you're enthusiastic about the horse. Yeah, it is. There is a lot of nuance to it. This is not a cut and dry. I'm giving you a horse, and, and that's who you bet, and that's not who you bet. Uh, that's a great example in that race. There was the other Siaker in that race, too, that wasn't working that great, and then all of a sudden popped up with the great work, whereas the, the, the horse that won, I only caught it twice, but it was solid, and I, I saw some quality there, and I kind of tipped that way. Uh, but but you're right, uh, there is a lot of nuance uh, in it, and you kind of have to get a grasp of how it all shapes up. You also simultaneously it should be acknowledged that it isn't just horses that are being touted for their good work. There's also the subtleties of the negatives, that big name horses that are coming into races a little dull and a little bit uh, uh, underwhelming and you've been in on big days you've been unbelievable helping people identify short priced favorites that are potentially going to underperform I, I think a, a major one that's a good point really good point sometimes as you know if you're playing picks tossing favorites might be more important than picking winners Absolutely. Uh, but a great scenario there I think was with exaggerator before the Belmont Absolutely. I did not care for his work at all. Um, I, I was on record as saying that my job is to give an honest opinion, not to sugarcoat things, and he bore out about seven wide on the turn. Uh, his tail was not in the position that said he was happy. So I, I, he was a total toss for me on all tickets that day. I didn't have creator, so I can't sit here and say <laughs> I made a bunch of money I did not. But I didn't use exaggerator. That was my, my claim to fame on Belmont Day. <laughs> well, and I, I think about Breeders' Cup, Wavell Avenue, uh, and, and uh, yeah. Stop Charging Maria. You and, and Welsh combined uh, with, with A-minus type uh, recommendations on the two of them. Uh, th there's so many. I mean, even, and it doesn't even have to be at Saratoga. Uh, on a big Saturday on Arlington Million Day last year, you were raving on Real Solution, who was p preparing here for the assignment at uh, Arlington. And so even, even out of town uh, on big uh, Saturdays, you, you've been very helpful. And, and I, I cannot recommend whether you buy the full package or the weekend packages. This is money so well spent because it, it only takes not just one horse for that $10. You can basically pay for the report for the meat uh, with one or, or two good tips that come out of, of Mike's observations. In terms of the way you and Welsh figure the assignments, because of course we've got certain challenges, and this is downstate too, you've got the training track and you've got the Belmont, Maine. Here we've got the Oklahoma and, and the Maine. In, in terms of being able to see everything that's going on, talk about how that's broken out. Well, in Florida, it's it's almost it, impossible. It's well, it's impossible because there's so many tracks. But we do uh, have Palm Meadows covered. We have Mike at Gulfstream, and then we also hire Dave Dave Norton. Norton for uh, Palm Beach Downs. Yeah. So you know you're missing pacing, but we have Florida pretty much covered. Belmont's tougher because I'm the only one there, so I have to go between the main and 
training, I don't get to the training all that much. It's extremely hard to see. I, if you've ever been sure. there, it's very tough to see. And for me, I get markings. I'm not getting the names of the horses, so yep. it's, it's, it's tough for me to get over there. But I am at the main mostly. Uh, so in those Belmont reports, you're going to miss a lot of the training track works. Uh, but up here at Saratoga, it's me well, at the sad. training track. It's Mike Welsh here at the main. And uh, we've done pretty well the last few years. I'm curious because you just alluded to it, but what are the nuts and bolts of it? I mean, uh, particularly up here at Saratoga, there could be mornings where there's dozens and dozens. How do you identify the horses? It's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, what I do is I, I record everything uh, uh, on my iPhone, on my voice recorder, and I'm, and I'm getting markings, I'm getting trainers, and I'm getting every uh, on splits. So I have to do a lot of math after the end of the day, subtracting my splits to get the actual splits. Uh, but it's a lot of work uh, sorting through all the markings of each horse. Uh, when the tab comes out following, uh, you know, in that afternoon, I have to go back and match them all up. Yeah, interesting. Uh, why don't we hit on some, some yeah. horses in particular? Uh, I pulled up a couple of replays on horses you can talk about who will be up here at Saratoga. We talked about that three-year-old Philly division coming up and being so exciting with Songbird coming and facing off with Karina Mia. We'll watch Karina Mia a few weeks ago in the Acorn. She looked great. I like Catherine Sophia a lot. She winds up third in here off the tracks, winds up second, who came back subsequently and, and won and kind of validated and flattered Karina Mia. Um, but Karina Mia, again, looking Coaching Club American Oaks against Songbird. You saw her work, work the other day. Yeah, in fact, I saw her July 8th. I really liked the move. She looked great, very easy, 25 and 2, 49 and 1, went out real well. July 15th, a few days ago, uh, I mentioned it. I'm not really trying to be that hyperbolic. It was one of the five or ten best workouts I've ever seen, <laughs> July 15th, uh, the 15th. Track might have been a tad quick. I had her in 35 and 4 to the top of the lane. As she was coming through, I would have guessed 101 and 3, 102 maybe. I had her in 58 and 4, shading 22. I mean, she shaded 23, came home in 22 and change. Went out 111 and 4, 126. At the Oklahoma training track is basically unheard of. Uh, she was just did it so easily. And she may be at a best at a mile, uh, but after that workout, if I was Bill Mott, I, I'd say let's let's get this race on. Uh, I, I feel that confident about the way she went and uh, to see how she stacks up with Songbird. Because in my opinion, I know Songbird won the Breeders' Cup, but I don't think she's faced anybody no, quite exactly. at the level as Karina Mia yet. So oh, what a showdown. Really exciting race that's shaping well, up Well, and me. especially with, uh, with the other players that are going to line up in here that could uh, invariably soften, uh, soften uh, Songbird up before Karina Mia even comes calling on her. I mean, if, uh, where, where are we with, uh, speaking of, uh, of course, it's over here at Green Tree, so we can't see, but uh, uh, the nice uh, Karen, Karina. 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 Yeah. Yeah, I've always been a huge, huge fan of hers, uh, that going back to that Lightstream race when she finished second in that maiden race uh, down at Gulf. She's always been a big fan of hers, but it looks like she's more sprint. Uh, she's, yeah. She's going to the sprinting route right now, going to the test, I believe. Is that the route? Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Because she won the victory ride. That's and, true. And, all, right, so and, gonna, all right, they're going to, yeah, it makes sense. I think she's following the cavorting uh, angle, okay. I think, with Karina. But she's, uh, these three-year-old fillies are really fun, I think, this year. Yeah, and let's talk about three-year-old boys. Three-year-old fillies are, are exciting, but I said earlier, it's going to be very exciting if we get the three separate winners of the Triple Crown races to come up for the Travers this year. But before that, the Jim Dandy. I'm pulling up the uh, Belmont Stakes. We're going to watch number 13, Creator, uh, win mm -hmm. this. Just win it over Destin by a nose. You saw Creator work the other day. Jim Dandy looks like that's in his future. You also saw Gunrunner, the nice Asmussen horse uh, that came out of the Derby to win the, the race down at uh, Churchill in prep for, and he'll be added to the Haskell. What did you see from those two? Yeah, they both worked on uh, July 12th. Gun, uh, Creator, rather, went, uh, went, went solo in Blinkers. Just an easy move uh, uh, in 49-2. and two. He did keep on going like he usually does. He, he does his best work after the wire. Uh, in his workouts, uh, uh, 103, 116, and 2. So nothing wrong at all. Creator looks to be as good as he's, as, uh, he's done now in the Belmont Stakes. Gunrunner is a horse that I'm very interested in. It seems like this three-year-old crop, it's, it's anybody's for the taking yeah, right now agree. as far as the Eclipse goes. I love, I love the horses on the, on the pace in the Derby. Gunrunner was that horse. He was on that fast pace. Yep. He stuck around and came back in a visually impressive mat when uh, the, the time kind of validated the, the visual nature of the race. 
I think it's there, his for the taking. If he really wants to step up the second half, I, I'm a big gun runner guy. I thought he went fantastic alongside Steelcase, who's a seven-year-old now, uh, made him look like just another horse. They finished really well, and he galloped out huge too. Uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm on, with the potential, I'm a gun runner guy right now, uh, uh, maybe at some prices going forward this summer. And of course, there's also gonna be plenty of horses that are gonna work into this. Dave Grenig this morning uh, with notes on Governor Malibu's work. Uh, Governor Malibu gonna be up here soon enough uh, for, uh, for uh, Christophe Clement and is either gonna go Carlin or Jim Dandy, it looks like. So there's also that, that second tier and, and you know some of those nibblers that are gonna turn up in here, not to mention uh, the ones that have been out in the far-flung regions, the Iowa Derby types, the Indiana Derby types. We'll see if Star Hill probably uh, comes back toward, uh, I would think, Kings Bishop. They'll maybe turn him back. Uh, you got Buff Bradley's gonna certainly show up with, uh, with that- uh, The player. The player undoubtedly, and uh, we'll see what happens with Cupid now. And we're forgetting about one horse, and I forgot about him too, Mohamed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Back here too. <laughs> and I saw him, I was I was up here uh, before Mike, so I was doing double duty up here, and I caught him. I caught him on the eighth on the main track. I thought he looked really good. It was a very easy move. He was totally level-headed, unlike the reports I heard, for, right. uh, like he was at Churchill. Um, a few days ago, Mike had seen him here, and he was raving about him. filled out. Afterwards, he said Mohamed looks great mentally. He was doing well, so he's kind of one of these forgotten horses yeah, who ran a, ran a heck of a derby as well. So um, th it's a, it's a wide open three year old male division, and then we have some superstar three year old fillies. So well, we just got a couple minutes left, but did you want to add on some two year olds? I want to get a couple of two year olds <laughs> because, as I mentioned last year, Mike with the big support when it came to outsider art. And when it came to play unified, two of the biggest prices of the season with uh, the juveniles. What uh, what have we seen that ca caught your eye? Well, I've only been here for a couple of weeks. I'm going to pull a, a, a little switch on you guys. I'm going to give you a dirt Chad Brown horse and a turf Todd Pletcher horse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I saw a nice work here on the main on July 8th. There were two horses, uh, Practical Joke and Theory and Practice, both into mischief um, horses actually sure. uh, one uh, theory and practice actually Louisiana bred but the track here on the main was on the slow side they went in 48 flat uh, maybe practical joke uh, was a little bit better but they both galloped out nicely as well uh, it's still early on and these two-year-olds change day to day but I thought that was a really good workout for two babies I would have guessed they were older horses so those are two dirt horses that uh, I've had my eye on Two turf horses that I've both seen twice, they've both been in company twice, is uh, Matryoshka Dull and Chastise for Todd Pletcher. They breezed a really nice, easy half on July 8th over the turf course. Uh, they went both went nice and easy, galloped out very well, and then they both came back on the 15th and, and worked a, a 103 and 3 on the turf with, with the dogs out. That's a quick time. Uh, maybe. Matryoshka doll was a hair best, but for again for two-year-olds that was a very solid move. Uh, Matryoshka doll is a Medallia Oro, paid 350 in Keeneland September, and Chastise is a Blame, uh, um, who was a private sale actually. But uh, those are some two-year-olds that I've got my eye on right now. We'll see how they develop here as the uh, the season gets. So started. practical joke, theory and practice, Matryoshka doll and chastise <laughs> that's it all right i've right. got them all written down all right. also want to ask you too like uh, last week of course uh, one of the really nice stories uh, of uh, the summer so far bobby on fleek chad brown louis lazanero homebred of louis named for bobby frankel debuts on frankel's birthday the fig came back middling uh 73 i think yet visually this looked like an any kind type of two-year-old. I, you know what? If I was Chad and the, the connections, I'm happy that the figure came back like that. Yeah. I, I, I don't think they want to get that big, huge figure first time out. He's a colt. When he came out of the tunnel, I would guess he's a four-year-old. I mean, he was just a beautiful colt. The way he did the race was so easy. Yep. Um, plenty left in the tank for him going forward. So I, I'm, I, I'm actually happy that he didn't run that yeah. crazy figure and, and then regress. Right, right. So. Uh, he's he's certainly he's the best two-year-old I've seen uh, over the last few months. Very nice. Very good. Mike Messi from the Daily Racing Forum. Workout reports uh, 
from uh, Mike and uh, Mike Welch as well, all meet long. As Steve said, a great way to uh, get a little inside information and maybe come up with uh, some prices. And well, we hopefully got four of them right here this morning. As it happens, the Belmont Report, which, which is online for today, yesterday and today, both were free. If you've right. never looked at it, you want to just get a feel for it, if you go uh, to the front page of DRF.com, You'll see Clocker Reports. Click on it. You'll get the free sample today. And just before we let you go, we only got a little time left, but give us a little idea of the, the gradings you give. Yeah, really, um, uh, B+. Plus. You mentioned Real Solution. I gave an A that day. I've given three A's in my life. I'm a tough grader, okay? So <laughs> an A- minus is excellent. B- plus is very good. And then, as you know, uh, the B's can have, you got to read the B's. Sometimes I give it a little bit of a bump, sometimes maybe not as good. Uh, but, you know, an easy B minus, a maintenance B minus is yep. ma maybe what exactly what you want to see a week before as well. So, uh, but once you get below that, now you're getting into the range where you probably don't want to wager too much great. money on and, and, <laughs> and a great suggestion to pull it up for free uh, today on the Belmont side and get an idea coming into the Saratoga meet. Mike, appreciate the visit. Thank you very much. Good you, luck on the rest of the meet. You can follow Mike on, uh, on Twitter as well, DRF Vesey, V E S C. E, and we also uh, thank Mike for his military service. Thank you, uh, Steve. I well. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank and uh, we'll wrap things up for this first Sunday edition of Loose on the Lead here at Saratoga. Look who's back. It's Steve Bick. Uh, thrilled to have him back in the house. We'll be here every Sunday morning, of course, during the meet from 10 until 11 a.m. It's time now to wrap things up. Oh, man, I forgot the, the contact info. Loose on the lead at yahoo.com. I've, I've forgotten to check the email. So uh, <laughs> I, you, was, I was just thinking that as I read it off. I thought, I wonder if we checked it recently. But, yeah. uh, let us let us know. Uh, shoot, shoot out an email so we know it still works. All right, we'll wrap things up for this edition of Loose on the Lead. Again, We've been here since Wednesday, Monday and Tuesday. Obviously, the track isn't open yet, so we, we are still on off days on Monday and Tuesdays. I'll be back with Racing Across America Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. In the meantime, enjoy the races, and we'll be back here, loose on the lead, next Sunday morning. See you then. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.